And let's commence our time of worship together this morning. As we are gathered, Jesus is here, one with each other. Jesus is here. And if Jesus wasn't here in our midst, there'd be no point in us being here. So we're here to worship the Lord together. Sing out your best from the very start. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. preparation being made for the coronation of the new king. There's been a king all our lifetime. He'll be here for the whole of eternity, and he's King Jesus. Jesus is king, and I will extol him, give him the glory, and honor his name. This morning, what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give.
I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see. Yet one stands near to be my guide. He'll show the way to me.
good for us to be able to sing, where he may lead me, I will go, for I have learned to trust him so. We'll stand this time and sing this as our opening hymn today. You'll see why when we come to Psalm 23. But let's stand after the introduction and sing to God's praise. Let me read to you some verses in John chapter 2. The first verse says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee, my Lord? is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the waters knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth wine, And when men have drunk, then that which is worse, but now has kept the good wine until now. This beginning 
of miracles to Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Many interesting things about that first miracle that is recorded of the Lord Jesus Christ, the turning of the water into wine. But there's a lovely phrase here which you and I should take to heart every single day of the week. And we'll be thinking about this this morning. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. That's a great challenge. It's also a great encouragement as we seek to live in the center of God's will. Let's pray together. We we'll commend everything into the Lord's hands. Let's ask for his blessing. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we come very humbly into your presence this morning realizing that you are a great God, that you are a thrice holy God, and that we ourselves have no merits to plead as we enter your presence. But we thank you, Father, that on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in the work that he has done at the place called Calvary, as your children, we have immediate access right into your very presence. We're able to come just now and tread the very courts of heaven itself. And Father, we know that you hear and you answer our prayers. We know that we are accepted before you in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, right at the commencement of our time together, we take this opportunity to bow before you, not just in praise, but also in prayer. Father, we thank you for the week that has just gone. We thank you that with all the ups and downs of our journey through life, that you have been with us. You have provided everything that we have need of. You have kept us from danger seen and unseen. And our Father, we thank you for every way that your hand has led us this past week. We thank you for every provision you have made for us, for truly, our Father, you are a faithful God to your people. We thank you we were reminded last week, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. We bless you, our Father, that you know our every need, both physical and spiritual. And we bless you that you're able to provide these things that we need. And for that, we give you our heartfelt thanks. We thank you, Father, for the health and strength that enables us to be here just now. And we thank you for the very desire that you have put in our hearts. We always look forward with great anticipation to the Lord's day. And what a privilege it is to be out amongst the Lord's people, around the Lord's word and singing the Lord's praise. Father, would you bless our time together? We know that many of us have possibly and probably come to this meeting carrying many a burden, facing many a battle in our individual lives or in our homes. But Father, we pray that you'd help us to rise above all of these things. And for the time that we spend in your presence, may we see none save Jesus only. And may we hear no man's voice, but only the voice of God. And may you give us grace to respond to your voice and to your word. Father, the word that we will consider together is the inspired, infallible word of God. And we thank you that it's through your word that you speak to us. You warm our hearts when the going is tough. You challenge us when we are wayward. You comfort us when we are weak. You direct us as we seek your mind and your will. And we're so grateful today that we have everything that we'll ever need in the word of the living God. 
Bless each of us, our Father, we pray just now. You know us individually. You know the homes we have left. We ask, our Father, that you would just draw near to us, that all of us, both saved and unsaved alike, will know that God is in this place and that we're here to worship and to wait upon him. And we're here to exalt the name of his Son, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray your blessing upon your word that will be preached right across our land and right across our nation where there is such a deep spiritual need. May you bless your servants. May you bless your word. May you turn again this land of ours and our nation back to God and to the truth of your word. To this end, we pray that you would rend the heavens you would come down amongst us, our Father, that you would forgive us for all our sin. You would forgive this land for its sin, our nation for its sin, and that we might be a people who would be restored again in our walk with the living God. Remember our missionary family who have gone out across the world in which we live, laboring today, some of them in very difficult places, and we commend them to you and ask that God would richly bless them. We think of our own Baptist missionaries in Peru and Spain and France and in Ireland, both north and south. We thank you for our own home-based missionaries and pray for them. We think of Dave and we thank our Father of the work in the schools. We think of Woody and Elaine and the team who work with Storos, not just locally, but further afield. We think of Letitia and Adam, and we pray God's blessing upon them. We think of Philip and Denise today, and Ethan, and ask that God would be with them. Remember Adam, our father, as he's over in Poland at this present time. Be with him and the team who are there, and use them on this Lord's day for your glory. Remember Eddie, as he heads off this Wednesday to Greece to labor for the Lord, would you be with him? Give him health and strength and Give him a very conscious sense of your presence with him. So, Father, these are our prayers just now as we come before you. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. And we long to sense that presence right throughout our time until we shake hands and we part the one from the other. Father God, make this a meeting different from other meetings. May it be we'll go home today and we'll talk to each other and to others about God, about what God did, about what God said. So prepare our hearts, we pray, for these things. And then our Father, do us good as we wait in your presence. These things we ask as always, asking for the forgiveness of all our sins. And we ask it all in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Now, Mark Harlan is going to come and make the necessary announcements, and then Mark today will speak with the boys and girls. Well, good morning, everyone. Could I take this opportunity to welcome you all to our morning worship and breaking of bread service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who will be listening in live on Facebook this morning. And if you're visiting with us, we give you a special welcome. After the ministry of God's word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember our Lord Jesus Christ as he has commanded us to do. If you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord this morning, we invite you to remain behind as we break bread together. As the pastor has already said, I'll be responsible for the children's talk this morning. Johnny and Jenny Finney will be on Children's Church, and Jennifer Russell, Selena Fairburn, and Jill Guinness will be on crest duty. Our prayer meeting at 5.45 this evening and then at 6.30 our gospel service. Pastor Taylor will continue with lessons from Dr. Luke and the title this evening will be the parable of the sower. Then the announcements for the incoming week on Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. we have parent and toddlers and then at 8.00 p.m. we have our ladies meeting and that will take the form of a praise and pastries evening. All ladies are very welcome and if you haven't been before 
uh, please take this opportunity to visit that meeting. Then on Wednesday at 8 p.m., our prayer meeting and Bible study and Pastor Taylor will continue with this series in Ephesians. And then on Friday, our Bible study at 12, 15 p.m., and that continues with the series Corinth, the Messy Church. Then next Lord's Day, the 7th of May, Sunday School and Bible class at 10 a.m. Then at 10.45 a.m., the prayer meeting, 11.30, our morning service and breaking of bread. Adam MacDonald will be responsible for the children's talk next Lord's Day. Lynn and I will be on Children's Church, and Valerie and Aaron Bale and Rita Lindsay will be on Crest Duty. Then at 6.30, our gospel service, and Pastor Taylor will be responsible for speaking at both services next Lord's Day. Just a wee leaflet to read out. This is in from David Crutchley at CEF. CEF has produced a special booklet aimed at helping Christian children share their faith. Now, I have just taken a wee brief. This is only a sample. Uh, I'm going to leave this on the table on the way out. If you would like to just take a browse through that, that's going to be sitting in the hall on the way out. But it's a booklet that's been designed and aimed at helping Christian children share their faith. The booklet is entitled Go and Tell. It takes the form of a 30-day journal with practical help for children to understand their faith better and share it simply with others. As he says, he has attached a sample. We plan to hold a seminar in Seaview Camp and Conference Center in Kilkeel on Monday the 15th of May at 8 p.m. There will be a show. Uh, how they'll show how the booklet can be used to help Christian children. We would warmly invite any children's workers from your church who might be interested to come along, there will be opportunity to place an order for your copies of Booklet on the night. We are making this known to churches across the area. Uh, they have all been contacted. If you please be interested in going to that, if you please contact myself or the pastor so they have the numbers of people that would be going so they can make appropriate arrangements for that night. That's all the announcements, and they're all made subject to the Lord. If we come down and ask the boys and girls if they would come down the front. We're just waiting on a few more coming down. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to see us all out. You know something? Do you know what's great this morning? I don't need these. It's not wonderful. Because everything I have is in big print this morning. Now, I don't know about you, boys and girls, but I love going out for walks. And I know some children don't like to walk. They like to be driven everywhere. But I love to go on big, long walks. And I go for walks early in the morning, probably when you're still asleep in your bed. I get up at half five, six o'clock every morning and go for a big long walk. And you see when I'm out, that's whenever I get the chance to talk to God. Because there's no one else there to talk to. I'm there just by myself. And when I'm out and about, there's one thing you get to notice which you don't normally because you're so occupied with everything that's going on around you. I see signs and this is one sign that i see most often it's havelock park and that's exactly where i live i live beside this and i go for a walk around havelock park every morning but then i go off around the town and there's all these other different signs and i'm sure you see these signs when you're in the car with your mum and your dad and these signs that we see they're all information signs. And there's different types. There's those that warn us. There's signs that direct us. And not too many of your mums and dads maybe adhere to this speed limit. But this is a 30 miles per hour speed limit. And this is an information. It's an instruction for us. And this is an instruction that we're supposed to obey. But as I was thinking about all these other signs, these signs got me thinking of the Bible. You see, my Bible is full of signs. It's full of places. It directs me. And it's full of God's instruction for our lives. 
And I started to put together a few signs this morning. And here's one here. See, the Bible tells me that God created all things. And I'm sure you all know in Sunday school that sin came into the world. And that sin, on this sign, it says sin separates us from God. God designed us and made us to have a relationship with him. But we can't have that relationship with him because of our sin. That sin separates us from God. Have you? Here's another one. This is a very serious one. Sin keeps you out of heaven. God desires that we're all going to be in heaven, but because of our sin, this sign is so serious because if we still have sin in our lives, sin keeps us out of heaven. So it not only separates us from God this morning, but it means that where he is, we can't be. But then we read this sign. In spite of our sin, and in spite of all the wrong things we do in life, here's a sign that says, God loves you. And that's something never to forget this morning. In spite of your sin, God still loves you. And you know, because God loves you, it takes me to a special place. A place that means so much to me. Now, you may not know where that place is, Golgotha. Maybe some of you also know it as Calvary. You see, Calvary is the most important place in the whole world. Because at the place of Calvary, God's love was displayed to us. And it tells us that Jesus loves us because there he went to the cross for our sins. You see, God's love directs us to Calvary. And then there we can see the sign and it helps us, it gives us that instruction that Jesus died for all of our sins. We can have our sins forgiven. You see, Jesus has done all the work. Jesus has paid the price for all of the wrong things that we have done, all our sinfulness. And if we take the time this morning to listen to God talking to us. And we ask the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts. He saves you. He takes away all of your sin. But you know, boys and girls, we live in a world today that tells us that there's many ways that we can get to heaven. Some people believe that they can get to heaven just by being a good person. And some people believe that by all the good works they do, that's also going to get them into heaven. And some people believe that because they have loads of money and they do good things with that money, that that's good enough for them to get into heaven. But there's one important sign, and I'm sure you have seen this sign. And this sign can be seen all over the place. And it says, one way. You see, Jesus is the only way. It says in this verse of scripture, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man, woman or child can come to God but by me. Jesus is the only way. And when you give your life to Jesus, Jesus removes the fact that you can't go to heaven because Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. There's a place that God and Jesus is preparing for us that one day we're going to be there with him. And we're no longer separated from God because when we ask Jesus into our heart, he makes it possible for us to have that relationship and we can call the almighty God of heaven our heavenly father. But you have to remember this morning there is only one way to get to heaven. There is only one way to have your sins forgiven. And that's by asking the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. And that's going to be our hymn this morning. We're going to sing one way God said to get to heaven. It's the only way.
we'll all stand for this year when it comes on, please. <coughs> Turning to Psalm number 23, Psalm 23, and I say this about tonight, don't make the Lord's day the Lord's half day. Mark said, the Lord give everything at Calvary, to give everything, surely he should receive the same from us. And tonight in our gospel meeting, because we've no singer, we're going to do it a little bit different in the sense that I asked three people out of the congregation to pick me their favorite hymn. So they give it to me, and throughout the week I have researched their three hymns, and I'm going to tell you the story behind the three hymns. Some of the hymns we sing, many of the hymns, or perhaps all of the hymns, except for a few, we don't know who wrote them. We don't know the background to them. We turn around and say, ah, that's a lovely hymn. So tonight there's three lovely hymns and I'm going to give you the background, those who wrote it, and the reason why they did so. We'll do that tonight and have no singers. Psalm 23, let's read verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading. Let's just bow for a moment quietly in prayer. Father, we come to your word, grateful that we have it, longing to hear your voice ministering to us, Father, we realize that there are many of us in these days who struggle with one thing or another. Sometimes we find it hard to be settled and to have peace and to be able to sit quietly in the presence of God. This world's a busy world. It occupies much of our time and our talents. But just teach us from your word today of the importance of this lovely psalm and applying it to our everyday life. Remember those today who need a touch upon them, those who are unwell, those led aside, those in residential care. Father, would you be with each one of them? We pray for Richard and pray that you'll lay your touch upon him and restore him soon to a good measure of health and strength. We think of Maud Kells today, a lady that we all know so well, who has been through surgery recently. And we pray for Maud, our Father, that you would encourage your servant at this time. She has been such an encouragement to so many people over the years. And today, may she feel right now 
that underneath and round about her are the everlasting arms of God. Remember, those who have been in for tests recently, waiting in results, give them a calmness and an assurance that you're with them. For those, our Father, who are facing such tests in weeks to come, Lord, we just ask that you'll go before them. We thank you that you're not a God who sits enthroned in heaven, who's unconcerned about us. We thank you you're deeply concerned about us individually. And so we commend our prayers and ourselves to you today that you might continue to work out your plan and your purpose in our lives. All these things we ask, pleading for your help just now. And we ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Last week, you and I began a series of studies in Psalm 23. I would say that many of us all have our own favorite psalms, but I'm sure that amidst those favorite psalms, there are many of us today who not only know Psalm 23, but we could quote that psalm off by heart. Remember that in the Old Testament scriptures, we come across a theme time and time again where God is described as the shepherd of his people or the shepherd of his sheep. When you and I come into the New Testament scriptures, that theme is again developed for us and it continues where we see the Lord Jesus Christ in a threefold way. He's the good shepherd in John 10. He's the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, and he's the great shepherd in Hebrews 13. As you and I began to look at Psalm 23, I trust not just again today, but in days to come, that we'll all learn valuable lessons from this psalm. As I said by way of introduction, sometimes when it comes to Psalm 23, if you said, I'm going to read Psalm 23, we're going to sing it, you feel, well, we're in the midst of a funeral, but that's not so. This is not just a funeral psalm. This is a psalm for everyday living as you and I live out our faith under the guidance and the care and the shepherding of God our Father. Last week, we thought about the uniqueness of our relationship. David simply says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David had a special relationship with God. The Lord is my shepherd. You see, folks, you need to be saved today to be able to speak about God as your shepherd. You need to be able to think about a time when you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you began that journey of faith, that walk with God that all of us are on when we know Christ until that day when either he comes to take us home or God calls us home to be with himself. And David knew whatever happened, the Lord is my shepherd. He was a frail, defenseless creature, but God was his all-sufficient shepherd. And you know, that's important, the Lord is my shepherd, but it's also intimate. You see, God is not a God who sits enthroned upon the heavens that he has created. God is interested in every single one of his children. You say to me, Pastor, that's not true of me today. If you knew where I was, if you knew what I'm coming through, if you understood my circumstances, you wouldn't be speaking to me about how God cares for me. That's the very thing I'm going to speak to you about this morning. Because you see, God is interested in every single one of his children. And David looks back throughout his journey in life. He had known God's care. He had known God's provision. He had known God's protection. And he had known God's presence. So for David, this was a, a very special relationship. Secondly, David had a very sure, secure relationship because, you see, in David's day, so much depended on the shepherd for the safety of the sheep. He was the protector. He was the provider. And they were closely attached and seldom apart. See, child of God, this morning, you're never alone. In all the dark experiences of life, in all the great blessings of life, whatever they might be and whenever they might come, 
you and I are not in these things alone. We're secure in Christ. We're loved with an everlasting love, kept by the power of God. And we know whom we have believed, and we know the day will come when he who has saved us will come and take us home to be with himself. But David had a very satisfying relationship. He had everything in God that he needed, and that's why he says, Jehovah is my shepherd, and in him I lack nothing. You're a Christian this morning, and you're not satisfied with God, and you're running to other things, to places, to people, to find satisfaction. You need to think again about your spiritual life. Jehovah alone, David says, is my shepherd, and in him I lack nothing. David was fully satisfied. Today we come again to Psalm 23, and our text this morning is verse 2, where we see what I'm calling the richness of our relationship. Listen again to verse 2 as I read it to you. David says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Beloved, I would honestly say of my own heart, and probably some of you would agree with me when you think about your own life today, that there are times when we just don't appreciate the unique relationship that we have with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't understand the way that God leads us in his providential care as we journey through life. Sometimes we find it difficult to understand God's way, let alone do it. I said this morning from John chapter 2, whatever he says unto you, do it. Sometimes we prepare ourselves for doing what the Lord wants us to do. And then the Lord says, this is the way, walk ye in it, and like Moses we have a hundred reasons why we can't do it. It's all we do with a fear. It has to do with it's not what I want to do with my life. And on and on the list goes. But beloved, understand them or not. When God says this is the way, God wants us to walk in it. See, sometimes in these dark, difficult days, it's difficult to accept things that God providentially permits to come our way. You know what I'm talking about. The things that come unexpectedly into our lives without a moment's notice, and they just turn our whole life upside down. The things that shatter our faith. Oh, yes, we're saved. And like Peter, Lord, I'm always with you. I'll never let you down. Lord, I'll trust you always. And something happens and, God, it's your fault. Why did you bring me this way? Shatters our faith. They leave us with so many unanswered questions. I've been there. Why me, Lord? Why now, Lord? Why this way, Lord? Why at this time, Lord? The questions can be endless. So I hope that what the psalmist says here, and just this one verse will bring all of these things and many more into perspective. And we'll realize the whys and the wherefores of what God does. Here's the first thing from this little verse. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Note firstly the shepherd's constraint. David says, he maketh me to lie down. He maketh me to lie down. Douglas Macmillan, as a young boy, had been a shepherd. He worked on a family farm on the most westerly part of the British mainland, along with his brothers and his aging father. 
The area on the family farm was vast. The flock of sheep were large and they were young. And Douglas McMillan said that he had learned many valuable lessons in his life as a shepherd. He was converted to Christ on the 14th of June in 1955. He left caring for 2,000 breeding ewes, and he went into the ministry to care for the people of God. In his ministry, he shared his lessons as a shepherd, as a young man. In fact, he put them all into a book. You can get it, buy it, and read it. It's on the 23rd Psalm. It's called, The Lord My Shepherd. Here's what Douglas Macmillan says. He says there are four reasons normally why sheep will not lie down. He says they'll not lie down, firstly, because of fear. He says, secondly, they will not lie down because of antagonism within the flock. He says they will not lie down if something is annoying them. And he says they will not lie down because they're hungry. In other words, unless they're peaceful, they're not at rest. You know, beloved, let me say this in passing, but I'm quite sure that those four things could be applied to those of us today in our walk with God, fear. It robs so many of us of our peace. It keeps us awake at night when we can't sleep because we're fearful of things that might never happen. Antagonism, especially in the church of God, causes disunity, withholds blessing, and discourages people who expect it to see better. So many things in life annoy us. What happens? They rob us of our joyful Christian living. And fourthly, many Christians today are hungry, spiritually speaking. Now, it might not appear to them. They might not say that. But they're hungry because, spiritually speaking, they neglect the reading of Scripture and because they don't enjoy consistent Bible teaching. But I'm going to approach this a little differently. David says here, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now here's David. Here's the young boy who grew up as a shepherd looking after his father's sheep. He had learned many lessons. He could have written a book, and of course, he tells us in different places in the Scriptures some of the things that he learned. But you see, here's David, and he's tending his father's sheep. And he's busy because he's moving them from pasture to pasture. He's taking them from place to place. He's caring for them morning and night. This man never leaves the side of his sheep. He knows them intimately. And sometimes they had to lie down and rest. And David's bringing something to us here of great importance and something that is very practical. There are times in our Christian lives when we need to do the same. We need to rest. Rest. You see, beloved, in the busyness of life, and it affects all of us, there are many Christians who don't take time, and they don't make time, to use David's words, to lie down, to find rest and to find nourishment and refreshment for their souls. They won't take a break. They feel if they take a break that somehow they're not working hard enough. They keep going. They never stop And you know what happens? It takes its toll on their life. It takes its toll on their health. It takes their toll on their family life and ultimately their spiritual lives. That's why I've met people, both missionaries and pastors, discouraged and despondent in the work and they're worn out. 
because they don't have the time to rest and refresh themselves in the Lord. There are many Christians today, and they've come apart at the seams because they didn't come apart from their busy lives to spend time with God. And there are many Christians today neglecting themselves. And they're not taking time to relax, to rest. And they're worn out physically and spiritually and ultimately mentally. Now, many of us are living through an era where spirituality and activity have been confused. They are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. We feel that if we're not involved in everything that's going, spending time going to every meeting around the country, we feel that it will not be spiritual. Sometimes it will be more spiritual sitting at home with an open Bible, nourishing yourself in the Word of God, being with the one who really matters. And sometimes when we don't take heed to ourselves, God takes a dealing with us. And you know what God does? He breaks into our busy schedule. And he changes things that you and I weren't prepared to change. And he makes us lie down that we might have nourishment and rest. Many years ago, in Christian work. I remember a lady asked me out to her home one night, just me and Christine, nobody else. I was expecting a lot of people, just the two of us. She says, come for supper. And as soon as I sat down, she looked at me and said, you're not well. She was a mental nurse. Oh, I says, I'm fine. She says, you are not well. I see it in your eyes. You're burnt out. I'm going to go and I'm going to tell the elders that you need a break. Oh, I says, don't do that, for they'll think I can't do my work. Well, she says, if you don't take time off, I'm going to tell them. She didn't tell them. And I didn't take time off. And then God broke into my circumstances, changed them all around, and I lay for three months in my back resting. Been better I had to stay myself and rested without the back. But sometimes God has to break into these programs of ours that we just cannot change. And David says he makes us lie down in green pastures. Let me say two things about that quickly. First of all, there's a need for rest. You see, whether it's Christian work, daily employment, Whatever we're doing, remember that you're not a machine. You're not a machine. Pastor one day was walking up the street to do a message. I knew him well. He was going to one of the local shops in town for something he needed where he was the pastor. And that particular morning, he was met by one of his congregation. She was well known in the church as a lady who had always something to say. And usually it was very critical. But because it was his day off, he had been doing other things around the garden. He wasn't dressed the way he should have been had he been at work. And the lady stopped him. And she said to him, Pastor, are you not working today? No, said the pastor, this is my day off. Huh, said the woman as she shrugged her shoulders. Do you not know that the devil never takes a day off? That's right, said the pastor, and I'm sure you wouldn't want me to be like him. (laughs) But, beloved, there are some of us who think it's wrong to take a day off. Some of us who think it's wrong to rest ourselves up. And you see, when we get to that place, sometimes he maketh me to lie down. You see, no one understands our frame like God, and he remembers we are dust. He knows our makeup. He knows what we can take. He knows what's best for us. And when we're stubborn and don't listen to good advice, he sometimes sets us apart before we come apart altogether. He makes us lie down. 
Many years ago as a young pastor, I remember sitting at a conference speaking with a man on one occasion. I was just thinking of the work of matter of months. This man sat down beside me. He said, you're John. I said, that's right. He says, lovely to meet you. And he shook my hand. And then he turned around and he said to me, listen, be careful in your work that you take time to rest. He said his church expected him to do everything, and so he did it. Not always for the Lord. You know why? He didn't want his people to think that he was lazy. He worked hard. He worked so hard he became exhausted. He was chasing his tail. He hadn't time to read, to pray, and then his ministry became stale. Exhaustion led to depression. Because he was afraid to ask his church for time off, took a nervous breakdown, and then left the work altogether. There's the need for rest. There's the need or the nature of this rest. He maketh me to lie down where? In green pastures. He doesn't make us lie anywhere. He makes us lie down in green pastures. David knew if the sheep were going to be refreshed, they had to be nourished. So he led them to green pastures where there were areas of lush grass. They could eat, be filled, lie down, be satisfied, and be content. See, beloved, when God takes us out of the heat of the battle, it's not always for us just to lie about for months and put our feet up and lie and watch the telly every day from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. He wants us to feed on the green grass that for us is the living word of God. He wants us to be nourished. He wants us to be helped. He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to spend time with him and to encourage ourselves in the Lord. See, sometimes when those times come and we're set aside, Sometimes I might spend more time complaining about why I'm there and there's so much to do and what am I going to, what am I? And God just says, don't worry about that. I've got all of that. All of that is in my control. David says he maketh me to lie down in cream pastures. The shepherd's constraint. Secondly, the shepherd's care quickly. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The psalm is full of rich descriptive language. A beautiful picture David gives to us here. Remember the land in which David lived was very warm. It was very dry. It was very barren. And unlike Northern Ireland, it didn't have much rain. In fact, David may have seen rain twice a year. Bible calls it early and latter years. Most in a sense, we have Rain twice a year too, from October to April and then from May to September. But ours just tends to all go together. Beloved, in David's time when the rains came, they enjoyed both by the shepherd and by the sheep. Now, I'm not a sheep farmer, but I'm told in good authority that if sheep don't get water, they'll not survive. Oh yes, they can catch the early dew and the grass. They can drink from a stream, but without water and food, they'll not survive. And therefore, it was necessary for the shepherd in David's day to take them to a stream where they could be well watered. But you see, there was a problem. Sheep will not normally drink out of a fast-flowing stream. They'll drink from still water. That's what David has in mind when he says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I remember many years ago, Christine will know this and she'll know her story. Whenever our first child, Karen, died, I wasn't in a great place in my life. Many people with all good intentions came to me to speak about God to speak about my need of salvation. But firstly, I wasn't interested, and secondly, I couldn't understand. Why would a God of love punish me in the way that he 
dead. One day at work, I was going around the different places and getting them to check their stock, and I went in, and a man was sitting in the office at the coal store. He turned around, and he said to me, just set everything down. He said, John, I'm not going to preach to you. But can I tell you a story? He said in Bible times when the shepherd would lead their sheep, sometimes they'd come to fast-flowing stream. The sheep wouldn't cross over, so the shepherd would walk back into the flock, and the shepherd would lift the lamb and put it under his arm, and he would go with the staff, and he would walk through that stormy water, and the sheep one by one would follow him across. And then he said this, He said, do you think maybe God has taken your lamb home so that you might follow? That was the only thing made sense to me as an unsaved man. Two simple things. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The first thing is this. We have a leading shepherd. He leadeth me. Do you know what that means? It means that your heavenly father this morning is continually supervising your life. Isn't that wonderful? With all the billions of people that now live in this world that God has made, that God, I can say like the psalmist, Thou, Lord, thinketh upon me, me, just me. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. He knows the way I take. He knows what's best in my life. He knows the dangers, the pitfalls, places of safety, refuges. He knows everything that we need for the journey, and all he asks is to follow him. Follow him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your That's not just for a wedding. That's for every Christian, every single day. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? Wherever we are today, we're never alone. We see a leading shepherd. We see a lovely scene. He leadeth me beside still waters. These are still waters. These are not stormy seas. This speaks of serenity and peacefulness. It speaks to our hearts today of being in the center of God's will. There's no better place to be. And when we live in obedience to him and follow his will and obey his word, you and I will find, whatever the waters are, will find them still peaceful. I'll close with this story because this is about a Christian. During the American Civil War, a Confederate soldier was sitting deep in a lonely wood. He was keeping guard over the whole camp, and it was dark and it was dangerous. And the soldier only had the light of the moon for his company. He was so terrified, he forgot about the God who was with him. And he was so fearful, he felt all alone and aware of the great danger that he faced. He was filled with great fear. Ah, but then he sat. He looked back over his life. He remembered Sunday school. And he thought about God's word. He then remembered how he had attended church growing up with his parents. And his heart was warm. And he remembered the day that he trusted Christ and everything changed. He began to sing. This is what he sung. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. The more he sung it, the more peace he found. So he continued to sing, other refuge have I none Hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave me, 
leave me not alone. Still support and comfort me. All my trust in thee is stead. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. He sung the words time and time again. Each time he was fearful until the fear left him. Number of years having left the army, he was singing as a, a Christian leader, singing for the Lord in a church one night. And he got up and he didn't even share why he was singing it, but he sang the same hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul. At the end of the meeting, a man approached him. He said to him, Sir, I have heard that voice before. He said, tell me this. Were you one night singing that song during the war as you were sitting out in the woods? Yes, said the man. I did, for my heart was filled with fear. Well, said the other man, that night I was one of a group of Union soldiers who came upon you. You didn't see me in the dark. My gun was upon you, and I was just ready to fire to kill you whenever I heard you sing. And he said, I simply couldn't fire. I slipped away. But I never forgot that song. And I never forgot your voice. See, beloved, whatever you're facing this morning, we're never alone. Savior's with us. Whatever we fear, we need not panic. He's aware of every situation in life. The Savior is always with us. And if we're willing, he will lead us every step of the way. The uniqueness of our relationship with God, Jehovah, is my shepherd, I shall not want. The richness of our relationship with God, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still water. Let's pray together just for a moment. Father, we realize it might be for some of us today that the waters are rising and the storms are great and our hearts are heavy and the future is bleak and worst of all, we feel all alone. But thank you for this reminder that we're never alone, for Jesus is with us. And we thank you, therefore, that we can face everything with the confidence that Jesus will lead me all the way. For those this morning, our Father, perhaps, who are at the moment worn out, weary with life, feel they can't give any more, would you just lovingly and graciously remind them to rest and to leave themselves in your hands? For not only is your grace sufficient for them and your word everything that they need, your strength will be made perfect in their weakness. So take this simple, simple explanation of your word this morning and make it real and relevant to each one of us, we pray, in the Savior's name. Amen. Let's sing together as we close this lovely hymn, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught, whatever I do, where'er I be. Look, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, still tis Jesus who leads you. He leadeth me. Let's stand.
even in the midst of that, our Father, sometimes the way is tough, sometimes difficult to understand. Sometimes, and please forgive us, it brings the wrong response from our hearts. Give us peace this morning and comfort to know wherever we are, he leadeth me. Bless those of us who remain to remember the Lord. Bless those who feel they must leave. Take them safely home. And throughout this incoming week, let us hear you say to us again and again, whatever he saith unto thee, do it. May we do it with all our hearts, and may we walk in the center of your will. We ask it in the Savior's name. Amen.